Dear colleagues, I'd like to uh, I suggest that we start. We have just uh, one and a half hours to discuss the topic which has different uh, aspects, perspectives, and uh, different turns and twists. And uh, so uh, we have very little time for to cover the topic of human resources. However, we're uh, confined to certain uh, time frame and uh, uh, the time uh, regulations will be stringent. We have at, uh, 10 or 12 minutes uh, for each speech uh, uh, for all the participants who sit around our almost round table and uh, we'll have uh, f about four minutes for uh, every uh, remark. I hope we'll get uh, our audience involved in, in, the, in the process. Uh, at the end of our session, we'll have uh, some uh, brainstorm, f uh, which will include very brief uh, pieces of input. Before we start, the position of the moderator uh, suggest that I give a certain introduction. I would say that when I was getting prepared for this session, I was interested in the following issues. The topic of human capital is quite legitimate in uh, the from the perspective of research. It is present everywhere. It is quite impossible to uh, omit it in different discussions on uh, urban development, uh, on industry development. And as a research topic, it does exist. However, in terms of managerial aspects, uh, uh, I mean, how uh, this object can be used, what tools are do exist for this purpose, what uh, tools are, add, are match the complexity of this object. It's quite a big question. I'm not talking about uh, narrower uh, uh, issues like motivating people. I'm talking about uh, human resources, which has been unfolding since the 1960s, which was initiated by renowned Nobel laureates. Uh, the question is whether we can uh, manage that. Or does this need to be managed at all? So I'm throwing this question in for discussion for the game. And I think that in the presentations, in uh, the presentations that we had before the forum, uh, of course, this question is present in, s in a certain way. So we could discuss this. And then the second question, my subjective perception of this uh, topic, probably the speakers would like to discuss it when we're talking about capital. We uh, we sometimes uh, move move on to certain economic aspects. We always emphasize the second word in the phrase human capital. We also always talk about the capital, how this capital can be used, can be functionalized and so on and so forth. Although the, dis the discussion within the last 10 to 15 years over the past uh, 10 uh, has shown that the idea of human resources or human capital is self-sufficient, it doesn't necessarily pertain to economic development or economic growth. Moreover, the idea of human capital is often referred to as a general one uh, uh, related to uh, human development. So the two concepts swap their positions. And the uh, most crucial point should be the development of the people of human capital. And social and economic development should accompany that. And the balance between these different approaches is something that uh, 
that is of uh, a certain interest, a certain problem, and if we're lucky, we can formulate something on this topic at the end of our round table. This discussion is public, so I would like, I would not like to be strictly academic. I would uh, rather uh, define certain general approaches to this problem, which has uh, not only scientific but also so social and cultural significance. That's something I was thinking bef about before the start of this session. I suggest that we move on to our main speakers. We have three main speeches. This will be Marcello Balbo, Michael Keith, and Alexander Auzan. Marcello Balbo will the chair of social and spatial inclusion of immigrants of UNESCO, professor of urban planning for at the University of Venice. Marcello, please, we welcome you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Thank you, the organizers of the Urban Forum. I'm very pleased to be here. I'll try to be very quick because the time is very short and the issue is very, the issue I'm going to uh, talk about is very, uh, is very complex. Um, I will address the issue of, uh, because that's my field of research, uh, of uh, um, cities and um, international migration, and uh, urban policies and international migration. And this, I think, fits very well into the Urban Forum, uh, because Moscow is going to be, and is already, and it is increasingly going to be a world city, and as such, uh, it will increasingly uh, be uh, involved uh, into uh, this topic and issue of international mi migrants arriving into the city. Let me just quickly go through my presentation, if I am able to do that. Uh, let me simply remind all of us that, <coughs> uh, well, first of all, that that the number of, of international migrants worldwide has uh, uh, grown uh, very, very rapidly, in, is growing and has grown very, very rapidly in, in the last few years. Um, the, last, the most recent data uh, we have, which come from the United, Station, the United Nations, tells us that the number of international migrants worldwide has gone, has gone up to 230 million, compared to only 175 in, in the year um, 2000. So, uh, as you can see, uh, m people move from one country to the other uh, more and more. And this, uh, this, as you might understand, uh, is is very um, is very obvious. Um, capital, goods, services move due to the growing globalization. Why shouldn't people? people move also. So this is a matter of fact. Migration, international migration, is taking place worldwide. Um, many, many countries are involved as destination countries. Many countries are involved as, as uh, outgoing countries. Um, it's a process uh, um, complicated, uh, but that cannot be stopped. This is the first point. Migration cannot be stopped. Um, and migration is not, not only south-north, but I will go very quickly on that because, and what is of interest is that migrants move increasingly to cities. And again, this is very obvious. Cities are the place where opportunities are. And Moscow is going to be, is already, and is increasingly going to be a city where opportunities will take place. And people go to city because they find ethnic, community, and family networks. So what m one has to expect is that uh, migration uh, will, uh, will grow, in, uh, will continue, and will grow in the coming years. And, and uh, I don't want to go into these details of circular and temporary migration. We don't have time. But this makes things even more complex. Uh, there, there is a 
major distinction which has to be kept in mind uh, between migrant migration policies and migrant policies. Migration policies are the policies which usually governments set up, try to set up, try to set up. Uh, because most of the time migration policies, state policies, govern, central government policies don't work. Um, because you see, the fact of migrating is a very complex decision, is a traumatic decision. If I decide to migrate from my country to another country, is due to the fact that I have um, the absolute need to migrate. I look for improving my living conditions and those of my uh, family, which may stay back home or I hope will come and will join me in the future. So if I decide to migrate is because really I, I have decided to do it. And whatever type of migration policy set up by the government uh, uh, I may hit into um, will not stop me. I come from a country, Italy, which has been until 20, 25 years ago a migration, an out-migration country. Millions of Italians have gone away. Now, in the last 20, 25 years, it has become a an immigration policy where people come from many different countries and they do whatever they can. Uh, you probably are aware of what happened only one and a half month ago in the Mediterranean Sea, in, in the Mediterranean Sea, where 270 people were drowned because they tr were trying to move from the northern African coast to Italy because they they. Uh, they have no alternative, they have no choice, so they move. And this raises the issue of migrants' policies. What are migrants' policies? Migrants' policies are those that cities, because migrants end up largely in cities, city government have to design, have to uh, implement, have to take up. Uh, let, me, let me stress the fact that any city government uh, uh, has a migrant policy. Even when they don't have a migrant policy, they have a migrant policy, which is not having a migrant policy. The migrants arrive, they settle the way they can, the place where they can, uh, and, and governments uh, has to deal with them. This is increasingly going to be so, as I was saying at the beginning, because mo in Moscow, uh, because Moscow is going to be an increasingly attractive city. So, we have, we have to move uh, the idea, the idea we work about on is that we need to move uh, to policies that uh, modify the perspective. Migrants have to, look at, be, have to be looked at as uh, citizens not as guests or uh, uh, uninvited guests. They have to be looked at as citizens. And therefore, uh, what a city has to do is uh, to facilitate the migrants access to services, to housing, to health, to education. Cities have to move from thinking of the presence of migrants and the issue of migration as an emergency issue to a project. Uh, therefore, to set up policies which respond to the need of migrants, who, by the way, let's never forget, are human beings. The third point is that cities have to move from a sort of solidarity type of approach to the promotion of citizenship, including the people arriving from elsewhere, from abroad, from different cultures. And I would think, I think I would end up, I hope I, uh, I've kept to the time, uh, stressing, strongly stressing the fact that the presence of migrants has to be looked at not 
both as a challenge, because having people uh, who bring with themselves uh, their own cultures, their own habits, uh, uh, their own religions, it's not easy to govern and to manage. But also we have to learn and to understand that they are a great opportunity for the local society. Right now we were sitting in a meeting with the mayor of Moscow and some other well-known people, and the focus of the people who spoke briefly was uh, uh, essentially, if not solely, on infrastructure, um, transportation, uh, investment, uh, capital, attracting capitals. Um, this is important. But unless this comes together with the understanding that the presence of people who bring in different, different diversity, diversity, is not a challenge, but it is not an opportunity, a city will never become a worldwide city able to compete with other worldwide uh, uh, cities. Let me simply remind you that cities like New York, London, Singapore, not to speak of the Emirates, which is a different story, uh, New York, uh, Paris, uh, London, Singapore, etc. These cities are made up of percentage of foreign population which go up to even 40, 45 percent, which shows the uh, enormous innovation and uh, asset that the presence of international migrants uh, is. So uh, we have to, it's, it's a long process, it's complicated. Um, um, in, the, in the documents uh, which uh, I've read, uh, it is stated that um, that 20% uh, it is est it is stated that it is estimated that 20% uh, of the crimes in London in sorry in Moscow are um, derived from the pres from my are, are carried out are, uh, in, uh, by migrants um, it may be true I have no idea it may be true I have no idea but at the same time, uh, we should never forget that migrants add to the uh, city product, if you want, to the national product, um, uh, an enormous percentage of the growth of the national product. And therefore, let's look at this issue from both the side of the difficulty it raises but the advantages, I would say, the benefits, it certainly brings into the local economy, I would say more than that, the local society. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, just for the upcoming discussion. Do you have direct, short questions from the audience to the speaker? We, we can accept two or three questions at the end of our round table. The speaker will give you the feedback, the, the answers. Does anyone want to, to say something, to ask something? You can ask your question in English or in Russian, but do it via the microphone. So the question is, the speaker has mentioned that m migrants contribute largely to the growth of uh, the national product and the city product. How can this uh, be performed? How can this take place if migration is normally uh, low-skilled people? Migrants are normally low-skilled uh, uh, employees. Yeah, the question is quite clear. I have another question. Does the, pos the possibility to incorporate the migrants into the city structure uh, depend on the stage of, uh, of uh, the migrants arriving in the city? Do they, do they uh, uh, arrive at the stage of a de well-developed city? So the model of incorporation of migrants, does it depend on uh, the stage at which they come? You're talking about the level of city development. You, we're talking about the 
city development level because we need to understand what is development level for the city is. We welcome, dear colleagues. No questions. I would like to thank you, Marcello. I would like to give the floor to Michael Kidd, director of the Center of Migration Policy and Society, co-director of the Oxford Program for the Future of Cities. Um, yeah, I see. All right. Thank you very much to the organizers of the, the this event. I uh, was um, I received very kindly two invitations. One asked me to speak for 10 minutes and one asked me to speak for 20 minutes. Um, I'm happy to speak for 10 minutes. I have slides for 20 minutes, so I'll run through some of the slides extremely quickly. So ap apologies for the subliminal images. Because I only re really want to say one thing that is very simple, which is that uh, there is a paradox we need to understand. Um, cities across the globe desperately need migrants. Uh, people in cities frequently don't like migrants. Uh, so how do we reconcile this, this paradox? Um, this comes out of work that I've been d doing in China, but also this is a book that came out a couple of weeks ago, so it's my advertisement uh, for the moment. But uh, it's, I think we should learn about what is happening globally to, to make sense of our policies locally. We know that globally that the move to the cities is phenomenal. People have talked about it at this conference. But just to give two statistics, the fact that within about 12 years, China will have 225 cities over a million people due to the processes of migration. Europe only has 35 today. India will have 68 cities by a, a million, over a million by 2030. This is a scale of movement to the, the city that is actually almost historically defining us at the moment. We also know that the level of hostility to migration is pretty much universal. Uh, Raj Thakri in Mumbai has generated a politics of the city against Bihari migrants and controlled the, the city as a result. In, in Europe, in various parts of Europe, we've seen the rise of sentiment against movement from Islamic countries. In Hong Kong, recently, uh, m migrants uh, who came to Hong Kong from the mainland in China were described as locusts in a big public advertisement that you see on the, on, on the screen. The reason for this uh, was that people were coming to use the health services in Hong Kong to have, have their babies, have children. In economics terms, this is often talked about as a problem of what economists call externalities. Migrants cost money and they bring in money. Uh, what that means is, in the, as we, our first speaker already said, in the future, the future economy, we depend on, as our moderator told us, human capital as much as other forms of capital. The future forms of capitalism are often talked about, Yamoulier Bouton talks about information capitalism or immaterial capitalism. They depend on human and capital to bring people together. Migrants therefore bring agglomeration economies. They bring what the economists call positive externalities. They also create uh, negative externalities, which are the costs of migration. There is a very simple point to this, which I'll just be very explicit about, is that we know that those externalities, those costs, the positive externalities, the benefits, um, that the benefits of the positive externalities, the costs of the negative externalities, we know that these work at different geographical scales and at different temporal scales. What I mean by that is that when migrants come into the city, they benefit the city economy across the whole city. The costs, though, work out at a different geographical scale, normally the geographical scale of the small neighborhood that witnesses very rapid change. So the benefits work at one geographical scale, the costs work at a different geographical scale. We also know that in time, the benefits work at one time scale and the costs work at a different time scale. Most migrants arrive when they're grown up, when they're young adults, they contribute to the labor force, they contribute taxes. They haven't been, they normally have not had to be paid for in terms of their school in terms of being born, in terms of their, their infancy. People tend to cost society when they're very young and when they're very old. Migrants tend to come cheap because they're already grown up. So the, the externalities that are positive come at the age of the 20, 25, 30, 35 of uh, most migrants, and they cost later on as they grow older. So in other words, the paradox of thinking about cities and migration is that we have these imbalances over time and in geographical scale. We, we know what that means is that migrants are, in the long term, beneficial for cities. Extraordinary proportion of uh, uh, top companies in America, over 40% of Fortune 500 companies, are started by migrants. Uh, but also we know that there is a scale of opposition that 
I've already just hinted at. We also know that when we're talking about migration, and one of the questions alluded to this, there are significant differences between skilled and unskilled, family migration, forced migration. But the point is, in labor market terms, there is a need for migrants that are skilled and unskilled. In economics, say, people, that people say there is no lump of labor. There is not one single set of jobs to go around. The fact is that as people arrive, they create new businesses. They create new demand. They create economic growth. So economic growth ties to migration, but it is also the case that um, we need to think about how cities can manage a process which, because of these challenges of both time and space in the externalities of migration, are difficult. They cause real challenge to urban government, to mayors, to policy makers. The economist Ed Glazer says that in this context we need to set our cities free. We need to allow cities to manage this process autonomously from nations frequently because cities are closer on the ground. Um, and what the economist uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize winning laureate Eleanor Ostrom says is that we need to think about the city as a commons, a bit like a fishing re resource. We need to think about how the commons is managed for the generations that are yet to come as well as the generations that are present. So it's not just about organizing our cities for those people that live here today, but it's also about thinking about the commons of the future. This is, again, is not a particularly new problem. The Romans said that we should aim to leave our city in a condition that is better for future generations than it is for our own. So that the point is, this is analytically, this is not a new problem. But what it does raise, it raises an issue about how we think about the balance between public interest and private interest, the state and the market, not least in terms of the way we think about housing and how the, there is a need to accommodate large flows of migrants. And at the same time, if we ignore those migrants, people will hide in the city. There are big flows of irregular migration to Moscow, but also to London, to cities across, across the globe. So how do we combine the different skills that we're talking about? As Marcello said, the skills of building the infrastructure, the bricks and mortar, with the skills of bringing communities together, the cultural building. What that means is we need to learn, I think, from what is happening in other cities across the world. In China, th some exciting things are, are happening. Uh, in Shenzhen, people talk about sh Shenzhen speed. Shenzhen is sometimes referred to the curator of this uh, uh, urban forum in the introduction to the, the, the documents here talks about Shenzhen being the biggest city in the world that nobody's ever heard of, uh, which is an interesting proposal, but it's a city that in 1978 had about 250,000 people. Depending on how you measure the numbers, now, just about 35 years later, it has somewhere between 15 and 20 million people living in the city. It has grown at that speed. I want to just suggest to you very quickly, because there's not time to go into more detail, but because not only did the China government set the city free, but underneath the city, in a lot of Chinese cities, the district governments become quite powerful in thinking about how you sell land, how you buy land, how you make houses. But even more powerful, what one finds in the growth model of, I'm going to jump a couple of these slides for the reasons I said, what one finds in Shenzhen is the, the Chongjunsun, which is literally the villages in the middle of the city. And something like 75 to 80 percent of the migrants to Shenzhen live in the, the villages in the, in the city. These are areas where old rural land rights sit in an old-fashioned way, slightly differently in China to the way in which urban land rights work. The very simple difference in the time I have available is that it means that the rural land rights, the village clans, organize themselves as joint stock companies. They organize themselves in incredibly uh, smart ways in a context where you also, and I'll come back to this in Moscow in a second, you still have the residual hukou legislation, which gives people residence rights and welfare rights in their place of birth where they've grown up, but not necessarily in the place they move to. This itself creates challenges, but what has happened in Shenzhen is that these villages in the city become very dynamic. Um, they sometimes are very explosive of mi migrants. The, the Wushu Feng uh, are known as handshake apartments. This is Yasha in the slide that you can see on screen. It's one architecture department in the United States claims this is the most high density uh, urban development outside the West Bank in Palestine. The, the Wushu Feng. Handshake apartments because you can reach out from the apartment and shake the hand of the person across the, across the way. But the, and it's sometimes said that what's happened is that these are peasants in the villages who don't grow crops anymore, they grow real estate. Um, that, that sense of the power of these uh, 
villages is seen also in the way in which they can grow eco economic value. Duffin is actually where they make more oil paintings than anywhere else in the world. You go to any hotel, including the hotels in Moscow, and you'll find oil paintings that are made by migrants. And you can buy a crate of, a crate of Picassos. You have uh, various forms of Russian art that you can buy at 100 pictures at a time. Different Different villages specialize in different ways economically. They accommodate migrants, sometimes exploitatively, but they're flexible. So as Shenzhen has moved up the value chain from the unskilled migration to the more skilled migration, they've actually, the, the villagers through the joint stock companies upgrade the housing stock. So the villages sit in a relationship with city government in negotiation. Not only in Ed Glazer's terms you need to set the cities free, but also set the districts free in terms of the experiments of property rights that are played out and the, 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 the villages become drivers of Shenzhen speed and the accommodation of new migrants. It's not the only ways in which these things are. I'm going to give you three very quick examples and then wrap up given the time. If you, if you look at uh, Istanbul, which has grown very rapidly through migration as well, the, the, the Getchikondu were forms of informal settlement where informal uh, uh, settlement produced a form of squatting or a form of people moving into land that the ownership was uncertain of. And that has been regularized, not without some challenges, but the migra that what that depends on is experiments with how we think about property rights, private property and public interest in the way I was suggesting. In Santiago, in Chile and many other examples of Latin America, we've seen the movement to the city and particularly the periphery of city challenging how we think about collective interests in the future of the city itself and, and informal settlements gradually becoming formalized. In, in Brazil, there was an experiment in the 1980s in Belo Horizonte where a particular planning regime was introduced to try and make that process work better for migrants. So in other words, what happened was that rather than just think about the state, city government, controlling the process of integration of migrants, you allowed power to small zones, special zones, like almost like special enterprise zones, where new zoning allowed local communities to take control of the design and shaping of their own neighborhoods. Whoops, sorry, I've now got, there we go. Uh -huh. It's also the case that, that that means that in some communities, people have used those geographical scales to jump from the very local to the transnational. So in India, in Mumbai, the National Slum Dwellers Association, speaking on behalf of migrants to the city, negotiated directly with the World Bank in Washington when World Bank were investing in infrastructure, transport infrastructure, in Mumbai itself. And in Phnom Penh in 2011, similarly, the area around Bunkuk Lake, you had negotiation with the finance, between international finance and very local communities as to how this played out in terms of thinking about the restructuring of the neighborhoods. In London as well, again, I'd talk longer if I had, had time, but I don't. What we've seen is the very rapid growth of London over the last few years, as a few other speakers have talked about. London is now growing at about 100,000 people a year, uh, and that puts particular pressure on some parts of the city. It puts particular pressure in ways in which, as Marcello said, we have both the responses of migrants and the responses of the state. Migrants sometimes choose to remain invisible, and so what is the case in London is somewhere between 200,000 and 450,000 people are present in the city who are irregular and invisible, and I think in Moscow you see something similar. But then at other times, migrants choose to make themselves visible through particular ethnic identities. So, for example, the Bangladeshi community in London tries to make claims on behalf of the Bangladeshi community. And then how they then get access to Michael, public sorry, housing. Sorry, sorry. Two minutes. Two oh, minutes. Okay. Yeah. It becomes a challenge. What that means, just I think in terms of Moscow, is that in all of these examples I have given, I think I've been eleven minutes so far. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh my clock. Okay, two minutes. Yeah, no, two minutes. Mm -hmm. What that means, I think, is that there are legacies of the, the Propiska regime in, in, in Russia, just as there are legacies of the Huko regime in, in China. And we need to think about what that means. We know that different citizenship status works at the level of the city as much as the nation. So there is different incorporation into the city as a whole. And so in the scale of, of 
the, the, the rapid growth of Moscow that we've seen, that challenges us to think about the, 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 the periphery, uh, the micro rayons, uh, in terms of how, how we might, I suggest, set them free in terms of buying and selling land, in terms of integration. What that means, I think, if you look globally, the point I would want to make, and this is the, the final, final two slides, which are just a couple of points to make, is that you very often see in... in 30, uh, second, 30 seconds for each. The, the handbook, <laughs> absolutely. In the handbooks, you see best practice. I'm trying to argue that we have very rarely best practice, but more often trade-offs, tensions between different kinds of policy making. On the one hand, you want neighborhood solidarity, and on the other hand, you want permeability to migrants. Places like New York and, my, and London work because they're permeable. They have low levels of solidarity and high levels of permeability. These trade off. Land zoning and creativity. We want to control the rational use of the land, but uh, work informally, one against the other. We also need to think about how we have, in a sense, the interests of the city at present, those people at present, but also the interests of the city that is yet to come, because migrants are the citizens of, of, of tomorrow. There are principles, I think, that we can develop, but those principles, and the final slide is actually five, four principles that came out of a uh, national commission in the United Kingdom that followed on from the bombings of 2000 and five in London, uh, which uh, I sat on. And the four principles were that we need to think about urban change and migration in context of what we call shared future, an understanding that people have different pasts, but a shared future. We need to think about citizenship at the local level as much as the national level. We need to think about what we call an ethics of hospitality. We need to recognize that the migrants will always be coming. The people are arriving in the present. And that demands a sense of visible social justice in the allocation of scarce resources in the commons. People can understand losing out in the game of allocation if they can understand why they lose out. And those four principles are closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Because Michael answered questions we may might ask him. But I think we will give to Michael an opportunity to answer other questions we may have during the discussion. I apologize, dear colleagues. I'd like to give the floor to the next speaker, to Alexander Ozan, the professor acting dean of the Faculty of Economics of the Lomonosov University of Moscow. Uh, good afternoon, dear friends. I would like to thank for inviting me to this session because are really open and important thing for myself because I'm a migrant in terms of mega city. I was born, I'm from a Moscow family, but I was born in Norilsk and I was brought to Moscow when I was three months old. So in this case, I'm a real migrant for this big city. I'm also an economist and I'm also have to answer the question from the moderator, what roles does the capital play when we talk about people? But I'm an institutional economist and think that the culture is more important than the economy and even more for the economy itself. That's why I would like to talk about the tools because the human capital is a capital which is 50 years old because Gary Becker made the officials from all the countries happy when it also managed uh, to ground the budget. We can uh, give answers whether it is skilled or non-skilled labor, how much we should pay for this or for that job. But we need to think about different questions when talking about local and external resources. It was interesting to listen to the examples from the South and North Italy when there was different cap types of capital about open and closed circle. It allows us to speak that uh, these sum of resources can bring to war or to certain joint positive effect. But I think we need a more complicated a tool, a kind of culture, capital, because we are really interested in cooperating, in cooperation of 
trust and behavior because the, this behavior can give can create challenges and problems or give any opportunities for the future. In this case, I would like to uh, give a text to show you the streamline of our, my presentation. On one hand, we know that Russia is losing a lot of talents who are migrating to other countries because most of them are educated at Moscow universities and Vladimir Zvarykin is a very good example. He, actually, the, he brought the idea of television. He created a product which is actually 20 Russian GDPs worth. But he was absolutely right that the best thing he, he invented was the switch. Uh, these examples are quite numerous. This pro these products are quite numerous, which can be subject of our the focus of our attention uh, moreover there can be a certain specific features uh, of uh, the population in the city uh, which uh, which is gathered in the, in the city and there are strong migration uh, flows from the south because russia has uh, generally lost its competition for uh, high uh, high skilled highly skilled uh, workforce from the west and it is filled by the flows from the south uh, what uh, can we uh, uh, what can we say about the, the cultural capital the first uh, instance is that uh, my colleagues have uh, done uh, f have made uh, the research have that they have made f uh, from the think tank project. The Strelka Institute also did take part in that. We uh, calculated the uh, migration and labor statistics of uh, the three major markets where our uh, uh, Russian people uh, emigrated: Israel, Germany, and the USA. Our uh, immigrants are quite uh, sustainable, competitive. And there are some correlation correlations which make us make it possible for us to say that our graduates are successful in different spheres. They are connected with the cultural characteristics which are measurable over uh, which have become measurable uh, uh, over the last thirty to forty years in Goha, Kapstad, and other cultural measurements. Well, can we draw a practical conclusion from that? Of course, there are two conclusions which can be made. Uh, there are uh, very good, uh, there's very good productive complex which produces, produces a, a very um, a qualif very qualified benefits for the for the for, for the large city, and uh, the migration can be different. It can be student migration. It can be uh, Ukrainian or Chinese migration from the uh, from uh, the uh, by the students who come here, and uh, of course. It is, uh, it is an, one aspect of our global competition in now in uh, the in among global cities. This uh, uh, diagram has been built according to Gelf Hofstad uh, method. This has been used by me several times when I had to convey the idea to the government, to the council of, to the federal council, why our reindustrialization projects hardly have any perspective of success. There is a relation between the expectations of uh, the population and what we can have in the long run. I can illustrate that over the past 20 years, our country, 20th century, our, comp our country has uh, built hi the hydro turbine, the spaceship, but we have not yet uh, built a car, a television set, and a refrigerator, which would be competitive. And uh, 
we can do that before we sh before we shift those those parameters because if we don't provide for mass standardized pr production we can do unique or uh, masterpiece uh, masterpiece products but we cannot make uh, serial products if we understand that, we can uh, come up with a policy in uh, migrants' policy in uh, the major cities. We we have to understand how this region is is uh, structured, how Russia is structured. Now we don't know that. We'll try to uh, contact the Urals Federal University next week to create a laboratory. We'll uh, invite Shlomo Weber, the best cultural diversity and economic development specialist in the world. Probably we can we can touch upon several things and we can look into several things. But these are just projects so far. As far as population is concerned, uh, the population uh, perceives the spontaneous influx of migrants in a certain way. This is the uh, this is how we mapped the countries which can be measured by European value studies. So we uh, compared different cultural and behavior behavioral uh, parameters, including the countries from which migrants come to Russia. Unfortunately, we don't have data for Asian countries. This has been made for humanitarian cooperation in the CIS and uh, what's especially interesting if we have those data we can measure the so-called cultural distances the cultural distances are perceivably do perceivably influence the, the cities and the and the communities if the cultural distances are high, investments are less probable. But uh, but con other contexts can 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 take place. If there are large cultural distances, then a certain filtration or special policies or programs should be put into effect. But uh, short cultural distances make it make the processes go smooth. It's a question of regional diversity. I've uh, talked about these issues several times over recent years uh, in uh, Siberia, in the in the Urals, and uh, the relation to migrants is different in different regions of Russia because our regions are different. We don't feel that too too much, but this is a question of a selective migrations policy. We, in the, when we understand which countries should donate migrants to us and what special specific measures we should uh, implement apart from school, about from education, culture, which uh, influence the behavioral uh, orientation. When I was 40 years old, I understood that people were different. At 50, I understood that it was good that they were different because you have to find different combinations, different uh, interactions to implement, uh, the, implement the fact that even permitted, even calculated marriage can be good if the calculation has been wonderful. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, do you have any other qu any any questions from the audience for further discussion? Можно по русски. Все равно переведут. Спасибо большое, Майк. Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation. It's been very interesting. Your speech gave me lots of ideas, and the Shenzhen example was a positive one in terms of economic parameters. We saw that the GDP growth was experienced by the city. And in principle, the uh, economic growth was tremendous. But there was no information in your presentation as to how the people live there. 
the pictures did scare me a lot and uh, I uh, I don't know if there is statistics about uh, suicides in Shenzhen or any statistical data on how people th feel in Shenzhen. Thank you so much. Thank you for this cunning uh, maneuver. Uh, any, any questions to Alexander? May I ask the distinguished experts about their recommendations on how to solve the immigrant problems? Uh, immigrants who who represent different cultural and religious uh, communities, because in Russia, up to 20 percent of population are Muslims. In Central Russia, are there any recommendations for the local authorities how to manage? how to run these communities and what should be done. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I have one to Alexander. I uh, understood about uh, understood about um, refrigerators and uh, cars, but why do we win ho in hockey and lose in football? Dear colleagues, this the range of our main uh, speeches is over so i welcome the participants of this discussion to to share their ideas in a free uh, process and uh, who would like to start maybe i will start if if i if i may sergey kapkov minister of uh, the moscow government of course, after Alexander, it's it's very easy to talk because the inter conf conflict between ethnicities is uh, contact is, is a conflict between conflict between cultures because there are people who are used to living by certain rules and the newcomers do have their own rules of living. So this is a, an intercultural uh, conflict which becomes an inter-ethnic conflict. If we talk about uh, our city, I do have a calculator. The official data says that we have 7 million uh, voters. And if we have uh, 14 million people, then we have uh, 2 million kids. So we have around, it's, it's a question to the audience. As far as the Moscow is concerned, as a capital city, it was built according a plan uh, in a big empire. We have about one million students in Moscow, in Moscow region. Not only inhabitants of Moscow, these are people who come from different regions across Russia and uh, across the former Soviet Union. Most of these younger people are not going to to uh, go back to their uh, homes. They they are looking for jobs here. They uh, work as uh, as workers in Saint Petersburg in 1917. So they are looking for their future. They don't know where they will find their jobs and where and uh, well the quality of their education, the quality of their system of values. I don't say, I can't say that it is uh, it is a stabilizing factor which can contribute to the development of the city. That is why I think it's important to uh, draw a line between the migrants from the post-Soviet uh, countries uh, these are temporary migrants and uh, those who come to Moscow in search of a better future to Moscow, Russians who come to Moscow, or just children of wealthy regional uh, businessmen or officials or entrepreneurs whose uh, parents do send them in Moscow in hope that they can find their job here and their future here. Uh, well, Moscow is somewhat different from Europe. When we see the slides uh, shown by Michael, the migrants, the newcomers, 
show that they start doing private business. They part. They become part of the city, and this is a big conflict uh, between them and the local population. In Moscow, the situation is different. Labor migration, uh, mostly work for public uh, utilities in the city or in the building industry of the city. If we take the migrants from Central Asia, they work uh, in the economy of the city. The city, uh, of course, it buys services from a private company, and the private company uh, uh, hires these immigrants. In the long run, if we remove the, this intermediary, then the city does employ these migrants. As our city is uh, always uh, afraid of snowfalls, of waste, so we cannot, we are willing to attract as many people as possible just to avoid those problems. As I can see from my perspective, there, are, there is a, an issue of, uh, of uh, bad employers who deceive those migrants who do not pay their salary, who, who just abandon those migrants with their problems. And as a result, those migrants become criminals, as uh, Marcello and Michael have have uh, mentioned. This city becomes alien to them, unfriendly to them, and that's why we we get uh, this reaction from the, from the migrants as well. All the migrants who have come to Moscow only I only mean labor migrants who have their major problems in Moscow they are aware of the area where they work if you come if you come to uh, a certain central street in Moscow or uh, they gather gather there because it's the territory uh, it's their territory Moscow is is their uh, home has become their home uh, there are certain safe uh, safe uh, uh, places where they know the local policemen and they feel they feel safe uh, because this uh, uh, police system does cover up for the migrants and they have their interest in, in that process well if we take a large survey I didn't know that uh, I could that we manage would manage to make a presentation we looked into the Moscow perception of uh, cultural differences, and we saw that in Moscow there is a large number of public places and uh, catering places which uh, have never been uh, present in Moscow, like uh, hookah bars, strip teas uh, clubs, and karaoke clubs. And uh, well, I don't know if we could call those people migrants. They are active peop active young entrepreneurs active young guys and girls from uh, Novosibirsk, uh, from other cities uh, in Russia who have uh, come to Moscow to live in the city and they have and they have brought with them the uh, ways of having fun which was usual in their home cities because the first cities abroad which which they have visited were Egypt Central Asia Emirates where this culture is present and the whole history of karaoke singing this is a this is this pertains to the sauna traditions when people when uh, men come together and uh, sing their songs so it's uh, it doesn't have to do with uh, uh, the Soviet tradition it's just the uh, so-called cultural leisure. We see that people who have come to Moscow five years ago, uh, they dislike the uh, migrants uh, as well as the, do the people f uh, who were born in Moscow, especially when when uh, when they hate, especially they uh, hate uh, people from Central Asia and. Uh, so people come to Moscow, and after five years, they feel like 
uh, those who were born in Moscow, and they're ready to defend their, their rights and their interests. So I've uh, come to listen to very distinguished and, uh, and uh, intelligent people, so I think the situation will not improve unless we react to that situation. This situation will aggravate every day in view of the fact that we don't have a law enforcement system which can drastically which can dr which can react uh, quite decisively to to uh, the migration from uh, both Russia and uh, other countries thank you thank you very much dear colleagues you're welcome thank you I would Olga Gulin I would really like the question on quality of migration, how this quality of migration can influence the quality of life. I would like to go back to the first presentation who was talking about the migration policy as something what is brought from the top to the bottom. Uh, and I also would like to remind you on the act adopted in July 2013. I'd like to say Moscow, the Moscow region, St. Petersburg and the Leningrad region introduced a special regime for migrants. For example, if an illegal migrant is caught in the cities, it, we will depart it back home as very soon. What doesn't happen in Kursk, Kazan, and other Russian city, Moscow and St. Petersburg have a very strong position towards the migrants. This is not the place, not the time to assess the situation, but also to really remember a story from 1950s of America when Eisenhower was the president and the southern states like Arizona and Texas were in panic when they said that they had three million immigrants and it was quite a big crisis. And it, Eisenhower said, to carry out a very strict policy, but in this time he got a letter from Lyndon Johnson and Fulbright from Arkansas and Texas, and they were writing to him when the border control forces and the police can get bribes and they can contribute to the development of the illegal immigration. Unfortunately, Eisenhower didn't listen to two senators and then he got the situation of wet necks. Now all these immigrants were really sent back home from the southern states and they had a lot of vict victims. So what we do we have now? The United States have 12 million illegal immigrants. So the strict and strong position towards the immigrants and migrants is not something what is really well backgrounded. We heard that 12% of crimes are committed by the migrants. I would all you to visit the website of the prosecutor's office. Less than 4% of official crimes are officially committed by the migrants. But what are the positive practices? How can we integrate people? Here we also have different models. The scientists have been talking about in the 50s, we were talking about five point of mobility, segregation, assimilation, and so on. I don't want to go deep into detail, but there are positive practices that can help. But the number of European countries, we were also were talking about Switzerland. I can say Switzerland. We started last year an integrational research on how the immigrants cooperate with the local people and they identified 10 indicators and now they're publishing a study research, study on how to make the immigrants to the part of the society in Germany and Austria that uh, they do have quote, uh, quotes uh, for the positions that can be taken by the migrants in the local administration. There are also very interesting cultural festivals where ethnical bands can also perform. This is what Berlin is doing, and these ethnical bands can also make other people familiar with the culture from different countries. Or you can also organize a football without borders. When the migrants' children can play football and cooperate with local 
kids where there are a lot of opportunities but you need to find them and I also remember how the Goethe used to say that the country which doesn't care about the migrants will disappear so migrants are here they won't disappear but we need to search the ways how to cooperate with them thank you Vladimir Mukamel from the uh, Institute of uh, Social Sciences um, I would like to point out some moments which are quite crucial and even frightening me because the way we discuss and the discussion initiated by the speakers today is unfortunately in contradiction with the opinion, with the public opinion in Russia. I would like to but also touch upon the main ideas I heard in the presentations of the speakers. We are not able to stop the migration. We need skilled and non-skilled workers. We need to provide an access to the hood jobs, to the social infrastructure. It is important to include the migrants socially to the com local community. As you said, it is important to make invisible to turn the invisible thing into visible one. It is also important to set up an ethics of hospitality. Not always the local population can be in solidarity with the migrants, but we need to set up platforms that will can unite people of different culture. This in one of the most important thing I know that that culture has a significant meaning meaning what do we have now in Russia because the population and the government forget that Moscow has been always a city of migrants even in the beginning of this 20th century around 20 percent of Moscovites were born in the city now probably 66 percent of the Moscovites who were born in the city was the maximum figure but it is different in different age groups if you look at the statistics official statistics you can see that 66% uh, of those who died in Moscow were not born in Moscow. These are Russians, but they were not born in Moscow. They just migrated to Moscow in the 20s or 30s or 40s or even 50s. It is also well known that we have split migrants into the into the constant and temporary ones but I think this split is uh, not real because our study shows that those who are so-called temporary migrants because they are registered probably one-third of them these are long-term migrants that don't leave Russia for more than 14 consecutive months and they all live with their families here they're probably fully integrated into the Russian society however uh, to get a um, stay permit is quite difficult it is obvious that the main problems are connected with the integration and adaptation of migrants uh, to the current situation, to the Moscow environment, because we need to understand how they can become future Russian citizens. But one of the main blockers for on this integration process is the population of local population reaction, because even Russians have 
quite a significant xenophobia, especially in Moscow and St. Pete. To a large extent, this attitude is artificially built as the most negative attitude towards the migrants is in those 